acknowledgements just so it's clear this is a very collaborative project and I came from Michigan State University so a lot of the work I'm talking about today I did while I was a grad student and a postdoc at the Center for Systems Integration and Sustainability and a lot of the work that we um, will be talking about comes from this book that we just published called Pandas and People Coupling the Human and Natural Systems for Sustainability and we also have collaborators with China which is um, we're going to talk about today um, China Conservation Research Center for the Giant Panda and then the Research Center for Equal Environmental Sciences, Chinese Academy of Sciences. Um, lots of, it's a really big collaborative research group of a lot of different, different disciplines. So these are my um, primary field assistants, who we like to call our postdocs. <laughs> they collected about 15 years of data. <laughs> um, <laughs> these are all my friends and lots of people living in um, the place where I work in rural China. So they also inform a lot of my understanding of the system and the work that I do. And lots and lots of um, funding organizations supported the work that I've done since I was a grad student. So, start out, um, I got into this field because I'm interested in the species. So, of course, as we know, around the world, there's extinctions much higher than the okay? There's animal species all over the world and extinction. So, uh, in order to understand what's going on in these systems, um, now we have Framework called the uh, public human and natural system or socio-ecological system. Uh, trying to understand interactions between the natural system and so understanding that we can't just do research over here on the natural side, we also have to understand what's happening on the human side and the interactions between them. really understand the complexity of the systems that we're studying. So this is just a snapshot of China, which is the area where I work. Um, so I don't work in a tropical area, so but it's really biodiverse, so I'm not going to really sell it here today. <laughs> for all the people who work in the jungle area, we would be interested. Um, really um, and then, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So uh, it's a temperate, I work in temperate forest, but it's a really interesting place. And a lot of similar processes going on that a lot of the guys are thinking about um, in this group. So I um, just wanted to point out this is a forest cover, um, original, uh, hypothesized, and then 2005. It's pretty alarming to see what's happening in China. And really, this is driven by the increase in the Chinese human population. So we now have 1.379 million people. That's pretty true. Afforestation or plantations? Yeah. Or is that just the forced loss? It's forced loss, yeah. That's amazing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So there's actually been a lot of afforestation recently in China that I'll talk about a little bit later, too. But so there's a there's a positive spin on it in recent years, especially the last five years or so, but um, yeah, historically there's a lot of loss. So yeah, 1.379 billion people will do that. Um, and it's been increasing really very rapidly for the last years or so. So you can see the US down here. Um, and India is catching up to China, mostly because of the China one child rule. I think it's kind of slowed down. As you can see, it is slowing down in China. This is the population rules, but still a lot of people. And also, not only number of people, but people changing their lifestyle. So, lots of people in China now are becoming more and more urban and more and more uh, industrialized. So, this is just one example of a change in lifestyle. It's the meat consumption in China. <laughs> um, it, from 1980 to today, it's uh, obviously an exponential increase. Uh, so, in the US, it's been increasing too, right? But in China, it's like really fast increasing. Uh, so, that's just one indicator that's showing how people are changing, how they're um, Absorbing how they're using resources and how they're extracting resources from the environment. And this can extend to other things like wood and other, other resources. So turning to the species that I'm interested in and the one that I've studied, um, I studied the giant panda. It's an endangered, well, no longer endangered now, it's a threatened species, but I'll get to that in a minute. <laughs> um, this is a, they live in China and this is their historic range. So this light gray color is a prehistoric distribution, we're guessing from fossils. And then by the 18th century, it was in this darker area here. And then today, it's in those tiny little dot areas. Um, so as you can see, it's been severely shrunk. It's a lot of people, a lot of development. Uh, 
Uh, it's also very fragmented. As this, lots of different patches. I think it's like 23 individual patches. A lot of them have cities and things in between them, so it's not like in its own. Um, so that's really kind of the uphill battle that we're facing which trying to conserve um, this species. Um, pandas are a really interesting species to study, uh, just for ecological reasons. Um, they're most known for being their adaptation to bamboo. So bamboo is their main food source, probably 99% bamboo. Um, and they have a lot of adaptations. They have this enlarged wrist bone um, that's evolved over time to grip bamboo. So if you ever notice them with food, you know, sometimes fast about how they grip bamboo. Um, see here, they're very good at gripping bamboo, um, which also helps them conserve more resource, um, consume more resources. They also have um, their teeth structure in the back is more built with plant material. Um, I have this picture of the cow here because that's to say that um, they're not ruminants. So cows have, as you can see, multiple stomachs, and so they down by material that's eating the grass. So bamboo is grass. Um, and so cows really digest grass quite well because they have the ruminant species, they have multiple stomachs. Pandas have digestive systems like ours, so they digest probably less than 20% of the thing. Um, <laughs> so they have to, that's why they eat all the time. Um, they eat probably 14 hours a day because as soon as they eat, it just goes through them and they have to get more nutrients. So pretty much they're sleeping and then they're eating. <laughs> that's pretty much their energy budget. <laughs> So, so it's an interesting system. But um, bamboo is the most available resource in this habitat everywhere. It's like 90% covered with food. So a lot of other species that were eating small mammals have died out. Pandas are still going strong <laughs> because they're coming everywhere. It multiplies very quickly. Uh, it's just people that are coming down the forest. So um, the panda is also known as a charismatic species. So um, this is showing some different images. So um, the panda is used in Chinese culture. Um, interestingly, though, it's modern Chinese culture. Like, if you go back in history, it's more, you see more dragons, animals, pandas aren't really present in historical texts from China. It's more in modern era. China's really taken on the panda as a national symbol. So, Chinese people are very proud of the panda, um, and they self-identify with it. So, if you just talk to people on the street, and I tell them what I do, they always, the first thing they always say is, you know, China is the only country that has pandas. <laughs> I know, that's why I came all the way here. No, <laughs> so, yeah, they're big part of it. Um, and then you see it more in a, in a modern context in billboards and things. And then this is a symbol for their Olympics that they had. The panda was one of the symbols. And then, of course, internationally, we have World Wildlife Fund um, adopted the panda symbol. And then we have kind of more popular culture <laughs> as well. <laughs> Interesting. Um, so they attract a lot of attention. Um, and this is a controversial, <laughs> interesting ad I like to show in a lot of different uh, talks I go to. Um, it's an ad from WWF that says we care more about the panda. It's just getting at the whole idea of cares about species, and they really attract a lot of conservation money in China. Um, and a lot of other species get ignored. The reasons behind that, I mean, people think that it's their um, black and white coloration is really unique and cute and I did self-identify, and so uh, they feel some kind of affinity to it. That's helped them in China uh, because the Chinese government again is really emphasized about conserving the panda. So this is their entire range. It's from Southwest China, and they, you can see all of these polygons are protected areas. So China has established I think, 70 protected areas for the species. Um, it's really extensive. It's a lot of money. It's great. I mean, from a conservation perspective, it's great to see them protect these habitats. And that's, that star is where I work. It's in the middle of the village. So the panda is uh, no longer endangered, um, according to the IUC. This is recent. Um, yeah, um, recent from this year, actually. Um, so the reason that it's been delisted is because some recent this down here shows some census of or survey of all the wild pandas, and they do so. They do it about every ten years or so. Um, and the last couple times, they've shown a steady, gradual increase in the number of pandas. Um, but it's pretty controversial in the panda scientific world. Um, I would probably say 100% of the researchers terrible <laughs> that this has been delisted. So um, these surveys are really subjective. And the error is like plus or minus 500, probably. So um, if you take that into consideration, um, there's still concerns, still desire to protect this person. 
but there have been great improvements too. So, so it's kind of a mixed bag. Um, yeah. Okay. So yeah, this was just to show that the, the population from the 50s and 70s is pretty unknown. So we don't know historically how many pens there were and how many there should be. So it's a philosophical question. It's impossible to say. Um, but pandas are interesting to study us also because where they live, um, they live in a bio biodiversity hotspot. So this map just shows the biodiversity hotspots around the world, and this one in China which overlaps with their habitat. Um, and you can see here, this is just some information about the mammal, bird, and amphibian diversity you can see across China. And you can see um, some hotspots in the southwest area. This is such a um, in the southwest area is where the pandas are. So. There's uh, particularly a lot of bird species. Um, a lot of bird, uh, bird, bird. Um, see the birds. Pretty amazing. So why is it so diverse? Um, go back to introductory conservation biology, which I'm teaching, <laughs> but I should show that this slide actually. Um, so there's a lot of reasons why the mountains where they live are so diverse. One of them is the north-south axis is really long, as you saw in the map there. Um, the elevation range is really very huge. I'll show you some pictures of it. Um, very topographically complex landscape. There's, of course, a lot of different types of habitats. Um, there's good connectivity, and there's a lot of water catchments that you'll see throughout, and very wide variety of different types of soils. So all these things, and a lot of rainfall in the summer, so all these things kind of combine to create a very a habitat that supports a lot of species. And it looks like this. It's a really beautiful forest. Again, not tropical, but hopefully interesting still. Um, <laughs> Uh, lots of bamboo in the understory and different tree species and um, yeah and so then on the other side of the human side we have ultra diversity this is Rick Steps work um, he does some really interesting stuff in mapping ultra diversity and this is the number of languages so as you can see in the southwest China there's a peak of um, different cultures and minority groups so that's a really interesting aspect of this area too in the area where I work there's uh, Tibetan people so this is their traditional friends and clothing that they wear, and they have language and a lot of different cultural practices that affect how they interact with resources. And this is some of the housing where they live, um, traditional housing. So it's an interesting um, aspect to study. So if we <laughs> if we're trying to understand um, human wildlife interactions from the perspective of pandas. Um, <gasps> It's interesting to go to the media as a starting point <laughs> to think about how, what's the relationship between people and pandas. Um, and this is kind of the kind of messages that you get. Yeah, I'm sure I know. Um, so does anyone have any observations that they'd like to share about this? Thoughts about um, what, what it looks like as far as the relationship between pandas? There are bears. There can be bears. The teddy bears. <laughs> yeah. Those are bears. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, man, it's love. Yes, yeah. Yes, it's an <laughs> So th those are actually veterinarians. Um, this is the, the Panda Club is a, um, a group that raises money. So you can join the Panda Club if you donate money. And money goes toward. Um, Taking care of the captive pandas in captivity and some research and conservation they're doing. So if you join the panda club, you donate extra money. These pictures are Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I would say yeah. I mean, um, if you look in the in the media, you'll see a lot of that caregiver type of uh, relationship portrayed. The idea that people uh, are have to take care of pandas that they can't take care of themselves because it's preventable. Um, and uh, yeah, so I, I think, and they're always, um, you always see baby panda pictures, so animals are portrayed very infantile, um, which again kind of goes back to the whole theory of how we can dominate over animals. If we portray them infantile and need us to take care of them, um, that's something that's perpetuated a lot in the yeah. So they, it kind of takes away from sort of the fierce aspect of the wild creature that you would expect. Um, and so, yeah, it's very, it's, it's interesting to go to the media too. <laughs> To look at that. So um, I have a story about this. This is um, a magazine from China 
which I encountered on a flight on my way back from China for being there after about three months, um, living in the field with no electricity. Um, <laughs> I was about to get on the plane and I saw this ad, um, and it just caused a period of reflection for me. The field um, looking like this. <laughs> so I probably, I don't think I, I was probably wearing those pants at the time. I am not, <laughs> not really sure, but that's me in the field, and those are my expert friends. Um, and this is very, like, sort of representative of my life there. Um, and I was confronted with this image coming back, which was very antithetical to my experience. <laughs> so it's just a, an interesting. Um, and a juxtaposition between how we portray relationships with people and how relationships with people and animals exist in the world. Um, so I was really interested in this image. So um, the gender is very prominent in the image, as well as this issue of animals being portrayed as babies. Um, and <laughs> I was interested in this image, so I looked it up, and actually it's an artist. It's an art, modern artist in China, and he does work looking at this issue. Um, and so he has a lot of different imagery. It's really interesting now, especially with reflect on water. But um, he uses the Western woman to represent and China is represented. So it's a political statement. Um, and it's really it's interesting that he put a woman for S. Um, yeah, she, yeah. I think she's supposed to be on yeah, yeah, actually. Yeah. That's who um, is supposed to be. Yeah. It's really interesting. And just her demeanor and the panda's demeanor, it's very, just like, looks very, and <laughs> like, And so he's just poking fun at the idea of like, why does China always want the US to take care of it or to coddle it? Or why are we looking to the US to take care of us? Or why are we looking to He has a lot of political commentary around religious, but it's really interesting how he specifically chose the panda to represent China. He was saying how he doesn't think the dragon is a good representation for China. Um, it's more, the dragon sort of works toward China now. Panda's really on China. So that's really an interesting um, side note there. But this is the kind of um, human panda interactions that I'm interested in. And these are the kind that I think are hidden. So you don't see images like this in the media when you look up this. But these are the people who are there. And these are the people who are interacting with panda on some of the day. They get up and they brush their teeth and they're in habitat and they're interacting with the environment in some way. Um, and so these are the stories that I think I'm most interested in about and about um, because there's a lot going on um, that's not told. And it was really obvious that these are kind of hidden stories when the earthquake happened. The major earthquake in 2008 in the area and it wiped out. A lot of people got killed actually. Uh, a lot of damage, billions of dollars of damage. And all of the news media about him like worrying about the camp and where they were going. All the other was fine because they knew your face there, and no one talked about this. No one had any idea that there are people living in it. There are people, thousands of people living in nature, and no one had any concept that there could be a relationship there. Is it inside the reserve? Yeah. Thousands of people live inside the reserve. So in the study area where I work, there's about 5,000 people living in So, yeah. So it uh, makes for some complicated interactions. So getting back to this framework, um, for the pandas, what this means to look at coupled human natural systems. On the natural side, we have all this natural forest that I've been talking about, and then the pandas themselves, and lots of other species, like this red panda, and lots of birds. Um, and then on the human side, we have all these people, and all the things that they're doing. So this is one of the villages on the road going through the reserve. Um, they're farmers, this is one of their farms. And um, they also do tourism now in the reserve, and they participate in livestock grazing, a lot of different activities that all interact with pen habitat in some way. And the landscape has really changed because I think in the 1980s, it was a time of rampant timber harvesting um, throughout China and um, in the panda reserves. And then also poaching was pretty prominent in the panda. Um, since then, the government really cracked down on both of these things, and you don't see it happen very often. If it is, it's illegal. And um, if you get caught poaching a panda, you could be in jail for probably It's really <laughs> So poaching is just really um, but today we see different, more nuanced types of interactions. So we see people collecting fuel wood, so not cutting down whole trees, but cutting down branches. <laughs> people are really creative, um, finding ways to use the resources. And then tourism, as I mentioned, and livestock grazing. These are kind of the more emerging human impacts that we're trying to manage. Again, this is the, the nature reserve where I work. 
Um, it's called Long, and as I mentioned about the elevation before, this is an area, it's about 2,000 square kilometers, and it goes from 1,000 to over 6,000 meters. So it's a huge gradient area. So you can drive up, actually, to almost the top, and you could drive up in a couple hours, you get really feel sick, because <laughs> it changes that quickly. Yeah, so, but that's why it supports such diversity, because every elevation is different. It needs different animal species living there, and so the lowest elevation is the people, that's where they're farming, and where the roading is. Then you start climbing up, and then you get into the panda habitat, which is that middle picture. That's where all the bamboo and trees and everything is. And then if you keep climbing up, you get above the tree line. So you get to snow-capped areas. So there's actually some snow leopards up there, a lot of grass, and some being threatened by that side. It's an interesting system okay, as well. Okay. So um, the conceptual framework in, for the work that we've done, um, we're trying to understand wildlife and then forests, because forests is one of the dominant um, land cover types that we're interested in. And then we have, of course, the local residents, and we're interested in aspects of their activities and their socioeconomic conditions and their spatial distribution. And then, of course, there's policies that affect how they behave and how they interact with wildlife, and then context of things like agricultural markets and tourism. Migration. So this is kind of the general framework that we work in. We have a lot of different methods in our group that we used to look at these issues. Um, how, there's people who did household surveys and secondary data collection, and then people who did forest surveys and field and GPS, and then using a lot of different kinds of models to try to bring a lot of different types of data together. My part, uh, one of the biggest parts that I was in charge of as a grad student was doing GPS collar research on wild pandas. Um, so that's just a picture of our GPS color pin that's here. Um, and I was studying things about their spatial distribution, um, their habitat use, space use, interactions with one another. Um, you can tell this is the male right here because his ears got chewed off. <laughs> so the real pandas don't look like on the cover of National Geographic. They look dirty. <laughs> and they have half of their ear chewed off. That's really common. So that's because they fight the males fight. Um, so, yeah, so this is the, the main part I was in charge of, but as you can probably tell in the content so far in the talk, I didn't really stay in my lane, so to speak. That's kind of involved in a lot of different things, but it's okay because I was encouraged to do that. Um, so it's really nice to be in it. Um, so I just want to talk about a couple lessons of what about different things, and, but stop me at any point if there's So one of the things that we... Um, it's a long-term study. People in my group have been working on this for 15 years. Um, I think I was still in high school when it was starting. <laughs> so, um, but over time, we really came to appreciate that there were a lot of unexpected things going on in the system. Um, the first was when it first started out, my boss uh, worked on this paper. Um, the first thing that was surprising was they were mapping the forest cover in the reserve over time, and they actually found that there was a faster decline in forest cover after the reserve was established compared to before. Um, which was obviously surprising. Um, and I think it really speaks to the increase in the human population, as I talked about all throughout China. It happened in the reserve at the reserve scale. So this just shows the increase in the number of people in, living inside the reserve over time. Um, and so that was really driving a lot of the decline in forest cover. And then not only that, but the number of households were increasing. So people were dividing up into different, instead of all the generations, they were dividing up into households, and then they're using double regions. They're heating two homes and using all these resources differently. Um, so that was all contributing. Um, but two of the policies that came about in the recent years to try to combat this issue, because one of the things is that inside the nature reserve, um, it's a minority group, it's Tibetan people. And there's a law that says you can't kick them out. You can't, try, you can't kick them out of the nature. Um, despite the fact that we hear about people being displaced a lot in China for reasons, they could not just take the people out. They tried to like voluntarily just put them into the city, and these are people who are like, you know, rural life, whatever they would say, they have no idea what they were doing. They didn't move, so they stayed. Um, and so over time, we're trying to figure out how to accommodate these people, um, and how to accommodate their lifestyle while also trying to keep the conservation goals. And these two programs were really kind of came to the fore as being um, great conservation ways of accomplishing this. So this first one is the Grange Green Program. Um, so this is a farm. As you can see, that looks like there's tree plantations. So the local people were paid to convert um, their farmland to tree, to forest plantations. Um, they received a subsidy for that. 
Um, that was one of the ways that they were able to increase the forest cover, um, overcome this forest loss. Um, and so it's been a successful program. And then this is the Natural Forest Conservation Program. Um, this is a national, both these are national policies in China. This one is a, a logging ban. So all, all logging was banned. Also, local people were uh, assigned to parcels. They divided the whole reserve up into parcels and then assigned each family to a parcel and said, okay, you're in charge of protecting this. And if anyone comes in and cuts trees, we will pay you. But if nobody cuts anything, then we'll pay you at the end of the year. So it worked really well because there's a lot of peer pressure and social acting. So nobody wants to screw their neighbor and their friends. So it really helped. Uh, it really worked um, to protect the forest. And they also received a subsidy for that. So, um, but one of the byproducts of this policy is that the policy is implemented on a household level. So people divided up their households more, further <laughs> to try to get more money. So this is the counteracting. This is another expect the unexpected. Um, people are very creative. Uh, so they got more money by dividing up into more households. So that was not really intended, <laughs> but that happened. Um, but it was still a successful program. And people decreased their fuel with consumption because they were um, not only were they not going to collect as much fuel wood, they were also using those subsidies they had in the program to pay for electricity. And at the same time, the electricity um, company was really improved the um, grid. So, although there was some switching to collecting branches happening. So you can go and see some trees and like all the branches are cut up the bottom of the time there's like a little <laughs> part of the tree. So that happened to some extent. Um, but yeah, so you can see that the forest cover was stabilized after the period of decline. It's actually increased again, mainly due to these two problems. So that's good, but I mean, from a conservation perspective. But I think over time, another lesson that we really learned was that it was important to diversify the conservation of blocks um, and try to look at a lot of different ways to achieve these two goals of conservation and, and human well-being. So one that I was really interested in, I was interested in zoning. Um, so every nature reserve in China is zoned and it has, it's kind of based on the UNESCO system where you're supposed to have three zones, a core zone, a buffer zone, and an experimental zone. Um, and so the core zone is supposed to be about biodiversity conservation and so nobody's supposed to go there except for like me, like the researchers, I'm sure that. Um, and then there's an experimental zone is supposed to be where the people are, where people live and do all their activities and then there's like a buffer region in between the two which is a little bit Nebulous, and there's not really clear guidelines on that, but it's supposed to soften the impacts. And so in the reserve, they set up these zones um, basically based on the road. So this line going through is the main road, and then the red dots is where all the people live. So they basically just said, okay, you can continue living in these areas and doing all these activities, but you're not allowed to go too far away from the road up into the forest where there's, it's, a, it's a nature reserve, so it's supposed to be protecting the species of this forest. So I was interested in looking at how effective the zoning was and uh, also the distribution of the zoning. So um, one thing I found, I overlaid the zoning with the existing, what we know about the distribution of pandas in the reserve, and you actually find that about 50% of the panda signs are in the buffer area. Um, so pandas are not all staying in this protected zone of the reserve. Um, they're in this buffer area that's um, vulnerable to human development, especially this area right here, they built a major tourist attraction, um, and so I think this area in particular is actually connects to outside the reserve um, and so not only is it important within the reserve but also outside as well so this, this area in particular is a vulnerable spot and then um, we also I was trying to map changes in these different uh, human impacts before and after the zoning and we found that houses and roads and mostly tourism facilities were pretty well contained in the experimental zone where they're supposed to be so no one went and built a hotel in the middle of the forest. So this is good. I mean, from a conservation perspective, it's working. Um, but then we would see things like livestock roaming through the forest in the middle of nowhere, um, where they're not supposed to be. So this is one of the big issues that we found, that some of these human activities on the ground that are um, more difficult to monitor um, are happening all throughout the reserve, in some areas that are not. Yep. In terms of that, uh, cattle are pretty rough. Yeah. So if you were like a fence. Yes. Yeah. Yes. So like something like livestock mm -hmm. instead of the This is a good point. Yeah, there's no fencing. So no one knows. Local people actually don't know where the boundaries are. And it's a paper, to some extent, it's a paper policy. Um, except if you're a developer and then you're coming and trying to build a 
Um, but it's true, livestock, um, they were roaming around. But I think to some extent, it depends on the speed, the, on, the, on the breed of, of livestock that you're talking about. Um, but they, people would go and check on them like once a week and try to keep them in contained areas. Um, but people would take a herd of, of horses and hike them up into nowhere, like several hours outside. So that situation was more like the people decided to be there. Um, and they stayed there because there's a water source there. Uh, so, yeah, some of, some of the, the livestock that's happening right along the border, like near people's houses, is more just animal society. But then if you get more into the forest, it's for like people, places. <laughs> but good point. Any place there for raising horses? Yeah, yeah. So um, the, I'm going to talk more about livestock, but the the big issue is with horses. Um, so there's only a limited amount of pasture, and there's and historically um, there's been cows and also yaks. Yaks are in the population, not in this area. Um, and then, but recently people started doing horses, and there wasn't enough forage in the pasture. So there was competition among the farmers between the people who had cows and the people and people like cows basically kicked out for quite somewhere else to go. <laughs> the only other place to go is the forest. So they went to the forest, yeah. To find food. Yeah. Yeah. Did you that entire area? Yes, that's a good question. We did both, um, and I don't, I didn't put the figure up here, but it's true. A good portion of the Koi area is actually above the tree line, <laughs> so it's an area that people wouldn't go anyway because it's so unacceptable. But animals don't live there anyway, accessible. So it's, it's protected, but it's not that valuable either way. Um, so that's part of it, but yeah, so we did see, um, yeah, these livestock herds though are in core panda habitat, um, the ones that we were monitoring. So those were the ones that were affecting areas that are important for panda. That was, yeah. The people here, they've been here for a long time, like longer. So the reserve was established in 19. Five, and the people were there long before that. So that's part of the ethical side of it too. You can't just establish a reserve. So, but yeah, so the Tibetans have kind of moved. They don't, they moved from Tibet through a lot of areas. Of the so, yeah. so through our work, we overlaying, in overlaying the panda distribution, as well as the distribution of humans and activities that are happening, we um, pinpointed some areas that are a concern that we might recommend revisiting the zone scheme if there was a desire to protect more of the European population without compromising existing human establishments. Um, so these are a couple areas that we pinpointed um, through our research, especially this area up here is a big concern. Um, and this area C right there is where I was doing research uh, with the GPS collar pandas. Um, and that was a big concern just to see the shape of that area. Um, there's a high degree of overlap or a high degree of intersection with buffer zone, um, which makes those pandas, I think, very difficult. Um, so we saw a lot of stock all throughout that area. So the, the last lesson I wanted to talk about, getting into more of livestock comes up later, but the only thing constant is change. Really the system, um, spending time there and learning about the system uh, and living in the system really helped me appreciate um, this framework was established originally in ecology, but now used a lot in socio-ecological theory of thinking about how systems change over time and how they go from one stable state to another, and there's periods of transition. The system changes from one to another. There's a period of reorganization um, and release, and then the system kind of cycles through different states. So we're seeing this in Mulong because, as I mentioned, there was a major earthquake that happened in 2008, and so the system really moved back a lot of ways. Um, a lot of human establishments were destroyed or damaged. Habitat was not affected very much. Um, it was more the human areas that were affected. Um, and so this is my one of my field assistant's houses. And that's where he lived for probably two years or three years after the earthquake. 
Um, so I stayed there with him sometimes <laughs> from the field. So yeah, this is what the local people are facing. Um, now he lives in a really fancy house and he has a big street. So he's doing better. But <laughs> at the time, it was a period of just really difficult time for people and trying to rebuild their lives, essentially. Luckily, not that many people died in the Wong itself because it was the middle of the afternoon, they were all farming. Um, so they're outside. Um, so that was funny, but a lot of areas outside of Wong died. Um, so essentially what happened, see that very well. <laughs> but the government really was trying to take advantage in a sense of this reset. And they said, let's rebuild everyone's houses, but let's rebuild them all next year. So let's try to redistribute the people <laughs> to make them more toward the road so they won't have to impact on the natural environment. Um, and so this is their plan for designing these little villages of apartments. Um, and the stylistically, the apartments are made to have to kind of look traditional in a sense of like a couple of the elements of design, but really it's cement, it's concrete, and it's structured in this community that obviously looks nothing like what a traditional Tibetan community would look like. Um, just the social structure in itself, uh, the way the houses are designed doesn't match the structure of the, the people. And also the fact that people still have farms that are several kilometers from here. How are they going to live here? And then farm? It wasn't really thought through as much. I think the government wanted these people to be able to take advantage of tourism opportunities. Um, they wanted to really build up tourism. But the problem that was going on is that tourism app collapsed after the earthquake because the road was totally impassable. So this is a period of tourism growth over time, and then this is the earthquake. And so after 2008, for probably two or three years, it was down here at zero. Like, I was the only Westerner in the reserve for, like, a couple of years. It was, yeah, because the road was so bad. There's so many landslides. Um, so, um, but now the road has been restored very, pretty recently in the last year or so, and the tourism is picking up again. So the system is going to cycle through again another system. What is it going to look like? It's a big question that we have as researchers. Um, I don't think it's going to look like it was before, because I I think a lot has changed. I think it's going to look like something different. Um, but there's probably eight different tourism investment companies that are investing dollars trying to build up tourism now. So it'll be really interesting to see what happens. Sure. And if the local people can benefit from it is the question. Because historically, they have not benefited very much. Um, and so thinking again, you know, Bulong is this tiny little reserve, but it's connected to the world because Tourists come from all over the place, all over different countries. International tourists come to see pandas, and local tourists come because it has a really good climate. It's really, really hot in Chinese in the summer, and all, the, all of the Chinese people <laughs> um, just for the climate. So it's interesting. Um, it'll be interesting to see how Luang connects back with the world now after this big change. And so also after the earthquake, you know, the natural, there was a whole lot of damage in the habitat, but there was some. Um, but the natural uh, process of recovery has been really interesting to watch. Um, plants are really amazing. Cover, they can go back. And the system is um, recovering in, in a new way, in a new forest system that we're trying to track. There was an opportunity uh, right after the earthquake. The, the government wanted to pay people to help restore the habitat. They had a huge chunk of money that the central government gave them for conservation. So they paid all the local people to go out and plant seeds in these areas that they identified as being disturbed. Um, huge amount of money. And it was successful in paying people because the government really wanted to give people money because they were suffering. Um, but conservation-wise, we detected it really was not successful because most of the areas they picked were right near the road and they were planted randomly in a systematic way and most of the seeds survived. So it was not a win-win situation, but at least the people got so getting back to the livestock question, this is another way that the system has been changing. So this is just showing the number of horses in the reserve. So horses are traditionally not used in this reserve. Um, and then, but in, in recent years, through social networking, people in Wolong have been increasingly connected to the communities outside. Um, and the outside communities do use horses. So there's been an increase, and even after the earthquake in 2008, this is continuing to increase, especially because tourism collapsed. So they started getting more and more horses. Um, but this had a pretty, when horses were put in the middle of nowhere in panda habitat, it had a pretty profound impact on pandas. So this just shows the decline in the number of panda signs um, after horses were introduced in one area. And that picture is a panda den tree. So pandas use dens to raise their young. 
because the babies are really tiny and they're helpless, basically. So um, that's a famous entry, actually, in a nice area of habitat. But in that picture, the feces that you see in the tree, that's horse, horse feces. So pandas basically left this area after the first years. So it's, uh, it's a pretty big issue. And we went to the nature reserve officials and we were talking about this issue because they had no idea what was happening because they don't monitor in a lot of these areas. And um, so that's another issue. But once they realized the severity of the issue in some areas, they banned horse because they were just supposed to not have forage nowhere to put them and it's just not sustainable. So once they did that, we were thinking maybe positively for you know impacts on pandas, but actually what happened is there was a pushback um, and one of the local governments wanted to was trying to deal with some negative feelings from the farmers. And so they said we're gonna institute a livestock incentive policy and so we'll pay you money to raise goats and sheep. So <laughs> so in another area of the reserve we actually saw an astronomical increase in livestock captured in our infrared cameras placed throughout the park um, And so this is not horses now, this is sheep. So it's just kind of evolving. <laughs> um, and really it just highlights the complexity of the situation when you have people in the reserve. Um, and you think you might have an idea of what would help the situation and it creates a new problem. Um, and so it really requires a long-term approach and a long-term research and and trying to figure out ways to accommodate people and make sure that they're getting what they need. I don't really have the solution about this livestock situation. I don't know what the solution is. I mean, from the payment for ecosystem services programs that we've seen in the reserve, from grain to grain, natural forest conservation, those have been really successful. So if there's some way to pay people to not <laughs> use livestock, I don't know what that would look like. Um, but if, if tourism really recovers in the way that we think it will, hopefully people might be able to benefit from that. Um, shift away from livestock, but we'll have to see what happens. So yeah, this just shows you know the impact on um, different species. So you can see this is before and after the livestock increased in the area. Um, pandas and red lines. So sorry. Yeah. Um, do you have any sense of why? Why, why are horses so, having problems? Yeah, so I didn't show the figure, but um, do I have a figure like this that shows how much bamboo they eat? They eat a huge eat. amount of bamboo. They eat the same amount of bamboo that panda does, so like 25 pounds a day. <laughs> but there's a herd of them, so there's like 25 of them in one area. So pandas are a density of one panda per 46 kilometers. So they can forage on bamboo and then not have an impact. Like they forage and then bamboo recovers. If you're 25 of you in that same space, eating the same amount, it's going to have an impact, and it's not going to recover the same way. And so then the food is needed. Question. Yeah. 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 They're selling it, selling it for me. Yeah, they use it as a bank too. I mean, if something happens, like wait, they have it, that resource, and they sell that. And then you know, if someone gets sick in their family, you know, these are really important things for people. So we have to figure out a way for them to still have these resources, um, but not in the middle of protected part of it. So, yeah, good question. Can you respond to what you on that? It's a good question. The attitudes, um, I'm really interested in studying more of, but they, they evolve over time. When I first got to the reserve, I, I sensed a lot of positive attitudes at that time because things were going well and people had money and people were getting benefits. So people in the reserve definitely benefit from these policies. Um, but then some if there's a shift in the policy um, after the earthquake, they felt like they were suffering and they weren't getting government, then it becomes a negative. Then they were, why can't we go and harvest stuff for us? Why can't we go? And so then the attitude shifted. Um, and now with the livestock, I think there's So I think it, ch it changes and situation. It's the extent to which they're met, but culturally, I think, and religiously, in their sense of religion, some of them really feel like it's bad luck to kill a panda, and actually they are afraid of harming them. They think something bad is going to happen. So there's a lot of interesting things. Good. 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 Good.
is a good point. Um, pandas are not like a carnivore where they don't go and kill people. They don't hurt people's livestock. They don't even hurt people. People don't even see them. <laughs> they're mysterious creatures that live in the woods and no one sees them, <laughs> including me. Um, they're very, they hate people. They don't go anywhere near people. So in that sense, the conflict isn't really a conflict in the same sense of, that you see with like a tiger or a lion or something like that. Um, it's a different type of, um, it's more indirect than some of these things I'm talking about. But one thing you do see, a lot of this forest recovery through these conservation policies that by panda conservation, as the forest is recovering around their farms, they're experiencing increase in predation by wild boar. The wild boar coming in and harming their farms. And so in an indirect way, that can be tied back to panda conservation because the, pan the panda policies are improving things, which is improving things for the wild boar, which is a species that can have a conflict with them. So yeah, it's interesting. There used to be, historically, but they got poached. So there's nothing, like not even small. There's small, there's a leopard cat, a small little cat, and there's a, a mustelid, like yellow-throated martin, um, small ones like that. Yeah. There used to be larger cats, but they Oh, sorry. This is a very good question. It was one of my biggest concerns when I first saw this happening. I'm not a disease specialist, but you would see feces all throughout rivers in the wall, in the middle of the habitat, and it's rivers that I know pandas are probably and it's like infested with horses. And it's like these are places where we would go and before the horses there, we would just go and drink. It was really pristine, but then that started happening, and we we're like, you know, this is this, this is terrible. So I'm sure the risk is very high. I think there's studies about um, disease transfer from wild dogs and pandas. There's concern about that as well, but you don't see as many of those. As um, in my opinion, it's potentially a disaster waiting to happen, but I don't know the probability. They do have dogs, yeah. So once in a while, yeah, they they, fend, they tie them up mostly to guard their houses. Uh, but occasionally you'll see them walking. But um, so back to this, I have a lot of interest in the future. I'm trying to some angles we haven't looked at as much. We've touched on a little bit of cultural elements. I'm interested in the culture and trying to understand more about how these minor cultures intersect with the habitat and kind of conservation goals and conservation in general. And gender as an issue that's really been not explored at all that I'm interested in looking at. Um, and then there's education, environmental education issues as well, thinking about how to, potential of bringing people from the cities to this area and trying to understand, get a better sense of appreciation for the natural world because people living in urban China don't have very few opportunities to interact with the natural world in this way. Um, that's a really big issue facing the country in general, people's behavior, and people like buying invasive species or, or buying threatened species like rhino and elephant. I, I agree that um, it's an issue of lack of education about conservation issues. So um, all these issues are very interesting to me going forward. And I think that's it. Thank you for your question.